morning, everybody. Welcome to our Sunday class. We're going to be uh, studying and uh, talking about doing weddings. And we'll uh, have a good class today. We're going to open the class with a, with a word of prayer. Father, we just uh, bless you this morning. God, just thank you for a beautiful day outside today, God. Lord, I just ask uh, for, uh, we just say, Holy Spirit, we just welcome you in this room. Ask you, Holy Spirit, just to fill this room this morning with your peace, with your comfort. I bless every uh, person that's here in this room today, and I just speak a blessing over their lives uh, for strength, for encouragement. Lord, I just pray for just a, uh, just an empowering, that the joy of the Lord would be their strength. I ask God that you would touch people's hearts today, and Lord, fill them with your joy. Lord, this morning we just want to say, God, we love you. Lord, we just bless you this morning. We bless Pastor Greg as he's yes. bringing the message tomorrow, uh, this morning. God, just bless him. Yes. God, give him your strength. We see that we just say, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth would speak. Thank you. So, Lord, we just love you today, God. We speak peace over every class, our nurseries, our children's church. Lord, just let your presence just permeate throughout this entire campus. We just love you this morning, God, and we pray all of these things in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. 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 Well, welcome everybody. You guys all got uh, handout sheets here. I uh, want to remind you real quick, just as we get going so I don't forget, uh, those of you who have missed classes that you need to make up classes, I've got a, um, a printout on the back table there. You just need to kind of run across, find your name, and you can see the dates uh, that you need to make up. And on those dates, all I'm asking you to do is just... Do a one-page, um, uh, just a one-page summary of what the class meant to you. That's all I need you guys to do, and uh, that way we'll let you guys uh, account for that. And if you need to know where to go to actually view that, what you want to do is you want to go to YouTube, and this can be for our, we've got some um, uh, alumni chaplains that are here visiting with us. Welcome, guys. Thank you for coming in. Um, you can, uh, if you want to view any of the classes that we even did this year, you go to YouTube and just go to skywaychaplain.com. And so there's a YouTube uh, site now, and it'll say Skyway Church or, or SkywayChaplain.com, and it'll pull it right up. And then you can look at every single class uh, that we've done. And not really broadcasting that out to other churches or anything yet. We're still probably going to tweak some things, but we wanted to download that, see what that actually looked like, and then we'll be uh, reviewing the classes, um, or the people that are teaching the classes will be reviewing it, how we actually facilitated the class, and uh, so that next year. We'll get all those classes that will be right in sync, right in order, and we're actually looking at possibly doing something where we offer uh, chaplaincy classes online uh, to be able to offer them to other churches and stuff. And then the booklets that you guys are all putting together with all your notes, uh, put together a packet to where we can actually give uh, to other churches and help them uh, start their own uh, chaplain program to help the churches and help the pastors out. So kind of a cool deal. But uh, YouTube, uh, SkywayChurchChaplain.com. So that's what we need to do there. And just one page, uh, what you got out of the um, uh, what you got out of the class on the dates that you guys have missed. So um, okay, we only got a couple more classes left here. You know, today we'll be doing marriages. Uh, next week we'll be doing sermon prep, uh, talking about how to prepare a sermon. Uh, if you're doing a funeral, if you're when you uh, do a wedding, if you're, you're going to be licensed, uh, you just need some you'll need some basics on how to kind of draft a message because uh, you basically will be doing a very very small short uh, message whenever you do a funeral and uh, not necessarily when you're doing a wedding it's pretty much pretty rote pretty script but you still have scripture verses that you're reading and you're wanting your heart to just you know be ready and be prepared and stuff so that's what the sermon prep will be about. Next two weeks after that, we'll actually have you present the, the sermon, a little short sermon, five, six-minute sermon uh, here in the class. And then the following, uh, uh, April 20th, just to remind everybody, that's Easter, no classes, okay? Well, everybody will be, will be in the sanctuary. We'll be doing three services, 8, 9, and 11. And then um, the 27th, we'll be talking about licensings. Those of you that want to be licensed, uh, you'll understand what the guidelines are, what you need to do to be licensed. We have uh, two ladies that are going to be uh, licensed um, uh, this year. Uh, Shirley Wyckoff and Deborah Nani are going to be licensed uh, when we do our graduation. And then we have our graduation, uh, I believe it's the May the 5th. 7th? Okay, thank you. May 7th. So it's Wednesday. So we'll graduate uh, chaplains, uh, internship, um, and uh, whatever WLI uh, graduates would be getting their 
uh, bachelor's, master's, uh, doctorate. So that will all be going on Wednesday, May 7th, right? Okay, let's grab our little inserts here. We'll talk about, we'll talk about weddings. I guess the first thing I'll do when I talk about weddings is let me talk about dress. It's actually not even on here, but uh, it's a hot topic and uh, very uh, near to my heart here today. Uh, I did a wedding yesterday, and, and we're, we're going to talk about how you go through and you do your uh, premarital and how you set your whole wedding in line uh, that they're going to do. And just in briefing and just talking, uh, to the couple and stuff, they said, Pastor Sam, we just want this really casual. So this is before I really started even um, getting any information from them. She goes, I just wanted to do a backyard wedding. He wanted to do a church wedding uh, just to, uh, to bless me. So I decided we'll just do the church wedding, but this is very casual. So my next comment to her was, which I never should have made, and I don't want you guys to ever make, but let me just tell you how the story went. Uh, so I said, so no shirt, no tie, a jacket, you know, just a jacket. Or she goes, no, it's just very, we just want it very casual. There's only going to be 10 people. How many people were actually there yesterday? More than 20. More, yes. There was probably 50 plus or so that was in, ended up being there. So what was only going to be very, very small and just in the, the church, and we just want to come in and then we're going to leave, uh, turned into something a little bit different. So, what I ended up doing is I wore a nice pair of jeans, really nice dress shirt, nice shoes, and a jacket. And um, when I came in, the groom had a, uh, a white suit on with a purple tie and a vest. The dad came in that was uh, going to give away, his, uh, give away his daughter. He was in a tux with a cummerbund. And so I knew I had blown it at that point. <laughs> so what I've explained to all the chaplains and those of you watching online, no matter what you're doing, whether you're doing a funeral or whether you're doing a wedding, you are the one that is facilitating that whole service. And if they want to come in shorts and a Hawaiian shirt, you still wear a shirt and a tie for the guys with dress slacks and dress shoes. And with ladies, you're wearing a nice skirt. If you want to wear a blazer, that's fine. But uh, that's the dress attire that we, and when we're conducting, no matter what we're doing. And even, uh, we're here in Arizona, and uh, even I've done graveside services that are very, very warm in the middle of the summer. But I always wear, I still wear a jacket uh, with a shirt and tie. So that's just your dress code, guys. You're always wearing a shirt and uh, a tie. Obviously, you're wearing a shirt. But uh, you wear a shirt, tie, and jacket uh, with dress slacks. And then, ladies, a nice, a nice dress. Uh, type of thing, whether it's a funeral, whether it's a wedding, because even if they're doing a backyard thing, uh, of course the bride was dressed to the nines, she had a beautiful, beautiful gown on, yeah. which she said she would wear a gown, but um, she said, no, it's just casual, and I'm, as I'm walking out the door, my daughter and my wife both said, you know, what are you doing wearing back to a wedding? <laughs> said, it's a casual wedding. There's no such thing, folks, as a casual wedding, okay, so... And one of the things that will happen, we'll, we'll learn about uh, how we're going to write these things down, but let me just use this wedding as, a, as an illustration. It's just notes for you to, to kind of put in your mind and stuff. Uh, we, we went down through the whole list, which we'll go through the questions for you to ask. Uh, but what we ended up doing was there ended up, there was not supposed to be a flower girl, there was not supposed to be a ring bearer. But when we got there, there was a flower girl and there was a ring bearer. Uh, they, the dad wasn't even going to give the daughter away. She was just going to walk down the aisle. The dad was going to walk the lady down the aisle. So the ring bearer and the flower girl is not too big of a deal because you just need to make sure when they're going to walk in. But if the dad's giving the daughter away, that's a whole thing that you have to add in uh, to your script, so to speak. You know, who is giving this woman to be married to this man? It's a pretty big gig, you know. And he's going to go, I'll say, I do. And I said, well, are you married? And he said, well, yes, sir. And I go, is your wife going to be here? And he says, well, yes, sir. And I said, well, let me just, so I'm doing this on the fly while we're, while we're working this thing. I said, it'd probably be good if you said her mother and I to be able to incorporate her in the wedding also. He goes, oh. Oh, okay, well, that would be good. I said, well, can you remember that? He goes, yes, I can remember that. I said, okay. But all this is after the wedding plan inside your office, in the home, or wherever you put this thing together. You always, I'm, I'm telling you all this, you just have to be ready to flow on the fly. Just uh, when they come in, uh, things might change. It might look a little bit different. And the thing is, you know, it's their day. Don't panic. A wedding, uh, I don't want to say never starts on time, but it never starts on time. 
Uh, the funeral usually starts on uh, funeral will usually start on time, but don't panic because it's three o'clock. The one thing I'll just tell you this: funerals and weddings. We did funerals last week, but before you start, ask someone that's responsible in that family that knows both families and say, "Are all the important people here?" Mm -hmm. Because the bride is in the back, and you're probably not going to get access to her. Right. But I'll tell you what, if part of the bride's family had not gotten there yet, and you started the wedding, and Aunt Sally didn't make it, she is not going to be happy. So what we want to do is you want to make sure that all the important people are there. And again, you're just happy. there will be someone, you will know, whenever you're doing a wedding, you'll know who's the one that's kind of in charge, okay? Because there's someone who's kind of... Helping run the show. You just want to ask them. And, and what I did, because it was a smaller wedding, I asked the groom, you know, Harold, is, is everybody here that you think is supposed to be here? From what I can see, Pastor Sam, I said, now how about on Rose's side of the families, everybody seemed to be here? Yeah, they seem to be here. I said, okay, good. So then we started. But I think it was, what time did we end up starting, lady? Do you remember? Like 3.45. Yeah, it was late. It was so it was supposed to be, was supposed to be 3, and it was probably, you know, 3.20, 3.30, something like that. So. I know. Yeah, I, well, I, I told everybody, hey, we'll, we'll be out of here in 25 minutes. Because yeah. really the service is very, very short. It doesn't last a long time. So, All right, well, let's, let's go over this. you got your very first page. And it, we just uh, we talked this out. We go weddings. Wedding, weddings are a very powerful, powerful service. Uh, you've been invited to participate in joining two separate individuals' lives together in a holy union, becoming one in God's eyes. This is an honor and a privilege that they have chosen you to conduct a ceremony. It's a wonderful opportunity to bless and to unite this couple in the eyes of God and all the friends and family members. Don't know if you really look at it like that when you first do, you know, weddings and stuff, but, you know, we're actually taking a scriptural principle in Genesis, very, very first wedding. God ordained it. It's not good for a man to be alone. And uh, it's talking about uh, uh, leaving your father and mother and that you would all, that you would cleave together and the two shall become one flesh. So all the way back in Genesis 2, uh, you see the very, very first uh, wedding. So it's a very powerful thing that you're doing to try not to get caught up in all the flower girls and tuxes and am I wearing the right jeans or the wrong jeans, but to understand that, hey, you know, I have the privilege in the eyes of God and in front of all these people, I get to unite these two uh, through the state of Arizona because you're licensed, if you get licensed. And as we talked about last week, to do a funeral, you don't have to be licensed. Everybody understand that? You don't have to be licensed to do a funeral. To do a wedding in any state, you have to be licensed. You have to have a license through the state. And you guys will, those of you who want to be licensed, will have a license through the state of Arizona. That allows you, gives you the authority to perform a wedding, okay? But you need to be licensed to perform a wedding. So very, very powerful thing that we're doing. Premarital counseling. Uh, we have a marriage manual available for you to use. This manual is designed uh, to help you uh, discuss important issues with a couple that may not uh, that they may not have discussed before. This manual has simple questions to ask and will help the new couple start their life off with biblical answers uh, to some of the problems that they might face in their marriage. This manual is entitled uh, "Preparing for Covenant Marriage." So this is what the manual looks like. And the manual covers about seven or eight topics. I didn't print, any these, uh, print these out. I wasn't, again, sure how many of you wanted to be licensed. What I will do uh, next week is I'll bring with me uh, uh, copies of this. So I'll print these out, and I'll have these available for you next week. Some of you alumni that are in here, if you guys are wanting a copy of this, uh, I'll have enough printed. I'll print up over 20 of these to where I can get these uh, to you guys. But what we do is if you have time, if you know in advance, because there's two different things. Sometimes a wedding just comes up and someone asks you to do a wedding and you don't even have time to do uh, any premarital counseling at all. But if you know with a little bit of uh, 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 time, you've got a little bit of time, you can get them this booklet. And we can get you, get you copies here from the church. You can send this or give this to the couple, have them read through this together themselves, and then when you come back to, to uh, do a premarital, uh, kind of a premarital counseling thing, you can talk to them about the book. Now, obviously, you're going to have to go through the book yourself so you know what's in the book. But uh, what I do is I go through and I say, hey, well, are there any stumbling places here? Did you guys come up some, with some things where you had uh, more conversation than not, you know, type of thing? And you just kind of listen to the couple. Here, here's the thing. Uh, because you're planning this wedding, you want to give them premarital counseling and stuff. But, you know, um, 
Uh, if they're a younger couple, they've never been married, maybe this is their first marriage, this is a good chance to let them know about budgeting, uh, uh, communication, um, how, what are your parenting styles, parenting styles are in here, uh, how do you communicate, is one of you more of a disciplinarian than not a disciplinarian? Uh, the very first page in here talks about being born again. That's one of the very first things that I, that I ask whenever someone asks me to do a marriage. Uh, I'll ask them, you know, are both of you guys born again? If they don't understand what born again is, I'll explain this is what born again means. I'm not asking you to join a church, but I'm just asking you, you know, do you both have a personal relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ? Because here's what can happen, folks. If you get people, you've probably, how many of you heard of the term unequally yoked? How many of you heard of that? Okay. That doesn't have anything to do with race. Uh, race could still play a factor uh, in uh, traditions, family traditions, how people do different things just because of difference in culture. But that's not what is meant by unequally yoked. Unequally yoked means whether both of them are a born-again Christian or not. Because if one's a Christian and one is not, that's called unequally yoked. Because their views in regards to God are totally different. One's totally lost, the other, one's, uh, the other one is saved. Now, it doesn't mean that I would not do a wedding like that, but I present that to them to let them know that that's going on. If the other person says, hey, I'm just not ready to do that yet, let me think about that, that's fine. But what I do do in the middle of talking to them, um, it's usually the lady, usually that's born again, the guy is usually not. That's been my percentage, okay? It could be, it could be both and, okay, or either or. But I ask the lady, the, the lady, I'll say, I just want you to know, do you understand what you're getting into? You know, here's a young man who's not born again. Uh, he's not going to have the same desires. He's not going to look at life the same way uh, in the eyes of Christ. And are you wanting your family and your kids to go to church? Are you wanting your, your kids to learn about God? I said, because right now you have the potential, even though it sounds like maybe his heart is open to this, he's not ready to make that commitment yet. Um, after you get married, there's going to be nothing that's going to uh, pressure him or push him to be able to do that. I just want you to understand as you're going into this, do you understand what you're getting into? Do you want to marry this guy when he's not born again? I've, said, I've had to say that. Because the bottom line, folks, whenever you're putting two people to one, you have to say this thing. You know, the marriages and the churches and, and actually uh, outside of the church, do you know what the statistic is right now for them to stay married? 50-50. In the church, even. So there's still, their scenarios are going on. You're not going to solve their life's problems in this premarital counseling thing. But all you're going to do is you're going to give them some tools. This is a good tool. And a lot of times I ask them, I said, did you guys read this? And uh, I'll look at them in, an eye, in their eyes. Did you really read this? I said, because it's very, very important. Now, sometimes you'll come up and someone will want you to do a wedding, and you don't even have time to do this. They're not wanting to do premarital counseling. The reason we do this and the reason we go through this book is because what we try to do is we try to have people do a covenant marriage. And what a covenant marriage is, I'll just kind of pass this around so you can kind of look at it and just to show you what it looks like. But a covenant marriage here in the state of Arizona, let me tell you about our state. Our state has uh, an amendment uh, for, have adopted a thing into law, which is called that you can go to the state and as opposed to just getting a regular marriage license, you can get a regular marriage license or you can get... This thing that you're seeing right now, you can get a covenant marriage license. And what we do when, we're, when we ask them to get a covenant marriage license is it makes it a lot harder for them to get a divorce. And what I mean a lot harder to get a divorce, you can do irreconcilable differences. You can pay a few hundred bucks, put your name in the newspaper, and you can get a divorce in X amount of time. I forget exactly how many weeks it is, but a very short period of time. What this does is you go, are you getting married for life? Because what they're doing is they are doing promises, they're giving away rings, and in the eyes of God and all the people, they're making a covenant together. And, if, and they might not understand what covenant is, but covenant is something that is until you die. Okay? And that's what a covenant is in, in a biblical terms. That's what's happening when you're marrying someone. They are entering into covenant to marriage uh, uh, together. Now, they're not going to understand that. That's what we explain to them. You're entering into a covenant together. And this covenant marriage license is you explain to them that as we talk about these things and you're getting a covenant marriage license, is if you're going to, if you guys for some reason begin to separate and you guys are thinking divorce, it's saying that you have to go through counseling 
to work, try to work things out and try to reconcile before you would get a divorce. That's what a covenant marriage license would do. Would you, do you, are you guys wanting to be married forever? Are you guys entering into a covenant together? Yes, Pastor said. There hasn't been one of them say no. <laughs> you know, now there's been some of them that have already got a, a marriage license. They go, you know, I don't think we want to do the covenant thing. I, I give them the option. But we strongly try to suggest that they do a covenant marriage license. It just helps keep families together. Because how families go, that's how the nation goes. Yes. So are we, we, are we the ones that actually have it? Or they just they would go down there themselves? They go down. Okay. Yeah, they got That's something they have to purchase. So you always, I mean, you always want to make sure as you're getting up closer to the wedding time, you always want to say, do you have your marriage license? Okay. Because if you don't have your marriage license, we're not doing a wedding. Uh, because legally, you can actually do this thing, but they need to have their marriage license from the state. And some people have forgot to bring their marriage license there. Uh, that's happened once. And uh, so luckily, I knew the couple and we were able to sign it the next day. But I you just, you've got to reemphasize, reemphasize, reemphasize. Do you have your marriage license and make sure who's going to bring the marriage license? Sure. Yeah, there's a there's a couple of things that I just want to um, just add to that. Um, Dr. Leo Godzich was um, instrumental in writing that. Um, so I, so when you go down there to um, to get that covenant marriage license, um, you ask them for it. It doesn't cost anything different from right. the other um, the other license, and. Um, and then also, there is, um, and I'm not sure if this is mandatory, it's just always been, you know, how um, it's, we've done things in our office, but um, where they would go through counseling, and then, um, because I'm a notary, I notarized all of the documents it says this counselor met with, and then the, both uh, the husband and wife-to-be sign that, and they're signing, they've gotten counseling, they take that down there, um, to get their license. Now, if that's not ever been up your practice, then yeah. perhaps that's No, you have, you have to do that. And I don't know if I have copied in your notes. There is that letter, exactly what Cherie's talking about. I don't know if it's in those notes or not. But along with the covenant marriage license, we have those letters that Jackie can add, the letter that Jackie can actually uh, notarize. Yeah. So whenever you, you know, there's just so much information to give you guys. I didn't want to over, totally overload you. But the covenant book will do the marriage. That's the little booklet that you actually will hand to the couple that you're seeing. And then once you talk to them, and there's been times when I've only counseled them one time. But I went through the whole thing, and it was a couple hours uh, just going through there. I let them know, because the main thing is that they know and they understand when they're doing the covenant marriage license is uh, you're going to have to go through more counseling if uh, you're wanting to get a divorce. And that's basically what that covenant thing is, to help people pause Take a little break, breathe a little bit, and then get with someone, mm -hmm. a pastor, a counselor, that might help them be able to reconcile uh, their differences as opposed to they just get upset, they get ticked off, and they want to get a quickie divorce. This helps to give them a cooling down period and kind of get their, their head back underneath them and kind of be thinking straight uh, mm -hmm. so that they can keep their uh, marriage together. So that's what's called this covenant uh, marriage license and stuff. So if you're able to do premarital counseling, uh, I've, I've done up to four different meetings. Uh, if they if they know it's way in, way in advance, I've met with them four times. But if you can meet with them a couple times, use this little booklet. That's totally good. And then there's other times when um, I just I just flat done the wedding and I have not sit down because they just they call. They want to have this done. This is we're wanting to get married and uh, they're wanting a pastor involved. And it could be they've been married once or twice before, you know, something like that. But they're just wanting someone to. Uh, to do their wedding, I've done I've done the weddings, you know I've done their weddings and stuff there before. So, so I just meet with them and find out what they what they'd like to see. But whenever someone's starting off, and I like this couple, the 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 bride had been married. This was her going to be her third marriage, and this was the groom's first marriage uh, that I just did. So I had to talk to them about um, uh, breaking ungodly soul ties. Uh, that's in the book. So there's a thing about uh, whenever you tie yourself to another individual. Uh, there's a breaking of soul ties, and I asked them, do they understand that? We prayed that prayer uh, to break soul ties, and I told them to go home and to talk to each other about the different relationships that they actually had, and there's a prayer in that book for them to be able to pray and renounce awesome. those relationships, and I told them to do that. Now, whether they did that or not, I don't know, mm -hmm. uh, but, and what I told them was, I know that's a hard thing to do, but I said, if you, you don't want to go into this marriage with secrets, 
You know, if you've had different relationships, then you need to get those out in the open. You need to let them know that's happened. You repent for those relationships. You pray this, the prayer of repentance. You release that person. You release that self. And you break those ungodly soul ties so that you can give yourself fully to uh, the person that you're marrying. So that's part, that's in that book that's there. The book is a very, very good book. Pastor Greg wrote this devotion uh, quite a few years back. But that was one of the things that I had to talk to him about. And if you've got people that are, um, have been married before, you very possibly could have what's called the blended family uh, scenario. And you want to talk about blended family. How are you doing with that? How do the kids feel about this wedding? Um, you know, you might want to you know, kind of help them. Uh, they had both of these, uh, they had young kids and they had older kids. Uh, and so I told them they needed to have a family meeting. And I told them they needed to involve their children. And I told them they, they needed to, if they didn't do it during the wedding ceremony, like incorporating the kids into the, the wedding ceremony, that they needed to have a family meeting and let them know how much they love them. Let them know that, you know, you're, you're going to be the best uh, a dad that you can be. Obviously, they're not the father or the mother, but you're wanting to be in their life, and you love them, and you're wanting to make a home for them and do security. Because when kids have come out of a divorce situation, there's a lot of insecurity. And they might have thought they did some things. So we talked about the blended family uh, scenario for quite, you know, for quite a while with them to make sure how they were going to do that, who's going to discipline. Uh, is everybody happy about the wedding, or are some people not? And um, thank God in this one they said everybody was pretty excited about it. But they needed to build the relationship with the kids more. And I said, please uh, have that family meeting. Go and do that before you do the wedding time. It'll make the wedding go so much you know, so much smoother. Now, whether they did or whether they didn't, I don't know, but those are the things when you kind of find out what the background is or what's going on, those are the things that you'll want to, you'll want to do when you're doing the premarital, premarital counseling type of portion. Any, any questions on this premarital counseling scenario? No? All right. Again, you're just going to have to go through this. The guide we have is, again, called Preparing for Covenant Marriage. First thing you want to make sure is people born again, uh, and, and I've had people get saved right, you know, right there. You know, I told them, hey, this is not about, I'm not asking you to join the church. You know, this is about a relationship, and this is about you guys being equally yoked together. Mm -hmm. uh, so that the things that you guys, that are important to you guys, it will be important. Because uh, Easter uh, is going to be different to a person who's saved or not saved. Mm -hmm. Christmas is going to be different to a person who's saved or not saved. And then if you've got uh, two couples that are of different cultural backgrounds, then you've got all the different... Uh, cultural uh, differences that are going to be there. And I talked to them about that. I said, do you understand the different, uh, you know, culture is going to be there? And if they're young or whatever, they go, oh, you know what, it just doesn't matter. And yeah. I'm like, okay. <laughs> I said, all right, it might not sound like it doesn't matter right now because you haven't experienced one family outing together yet. <laughs> and you got the whole, when you start doing that, that's a very overwhelming, you know, type of scenario. Mm -hmm. Just like, you know, me wearing jeans and uh, mm -hmm. having two black couples that were getting married, and, you know, where was my head in thinking that they're not going to dress to the nines? <laughs> you know, uh, even when she looked at me square in the face and said, no, Pastor Sam, no jacket, no, just casual, I should have known. So that's just, you know, for me, who's done many, many, many different weddings uh, to, uh, to do that. And so that's the type of thing that you're uh, counseling when you're talking to people, especially if they've got... Uh, different cultural uh, backgrounds. Hispanic culture different from the black culture versus the white culture. And then the other thing that I've done uh, one time was um, I actually did uh, do a, a wedding where a Christian lady married a Muslim. And um, I told her right in front of him that I thought that this was not a good idea. I told her that I thought that this was uh, not going to work at all. Uh, but he said, no, I, I, I like all these different uh, faiths. You know, he just said a bunch of different things. And bottom line is uh, they ended up getting married. Uh, I did the premarital counseling. I did not do the wedding because I wouldn't do the wedding. Um, I just, I would not do that wedding. Uh, only because I know what the nature and the background of that is. Um, if someone's not born again, there are scripture verses in the Bible that actually says that the, the spouse that is born again actually sanctifies mm -hmm. their home. It sanctifies their house of yeah. the unbeliever. Mm -hmm. And then there's different, even different things about if that person ever does get uh, born again, when you're mm -hmm. talking about divorce, it actually says to let that person go. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you can read Corinthians, and Corinthians will talk a lot about wedding. It talks about premarital, um, uh, premarital things, those type of things. 
but it actually does say that the believing spouse actually sanctifies their home. Mm -hmm. So if someone's like, well, gosh, he's, let's say he's the head of the house, uh, and he's not born again, you can actually say that there, you know, there's scripture verse that says, because you're born again, that you bring sanctification to your home. So your home is not an unholy place. Mm -hmm. He's just not born again, and you want to get him, you, we want to get him born again because you want him sure. to be in the kingdom of God. And you're wanting to raise your kids uh, mm -hmm. in church, so they're going to want to know why doesn't dad go to church? Mm -hmm. Is dad going to go to heaven when they die? You know, all those different types of things will come up. I say all those things out loud because they might not be thinking about them because they're just wanting to get married, and it's all about the dress and, and the limo and, mm -hmm. and the ring and just the ceremony and stuff. And you got to kind of help bring the balloon down. Uh, to reality and just kind of talk about some of the real hard issues because after the wedding ceremony is over, they will be faced with all the above. And so we just want to do the best we can, you know, to love on them and encourage them and uh, to get them focused in to get them focused in that direction. Okay. Yes. 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 So the wedding that you didn't do with the Muslim, do you have a yeah, uh, the reason I, I'll just be real honest with you, the reason I didn't do the uh, the Muslim uh, wedding with the guy and the, and the gals because that was totally, totally uh, an unequally yoked type of thing. And even though, you know, I know this is going on YouTube, but, uh, you know, there's, there's uh, in, in the Muslim or is Islamic religion or faith, they say, well, there's some that are radical and some that are not. But if yes. they're practicing and they believe that they're Muslim, if you read the Quran and you read mm -hmm. all these different things, we as born again Christians are called infidels, and we are very hostile towards them. And in the Bible, it said uh, in their in their book it says to kill all infidels and Israel, and talking about born again Christians. Mm -hmm. So whether they are American and they're all cool that type of thing, if they're brought up in that culture and that background, uh, I go with the scripture verses that. Um, you know, the, the prophet told Saul to kill Agag and all the Amalekites and stuff, and he did not. And when he did not, that thing continued to affect him, or affect Christianity, the Jewish race, uh, trying to be wiped out for all the way up into even now, because that's the same uh, type of religion that are fighting and going against Israel and do not want to see Israel as a nation and basically want to see them destroyed. That's kind of the hard, cold facts on that. Do I, did I dislike this guy? Did I uh, not want to be around this guy? He was, he was a really nice guy, and I'm not saying that there's not nice families here in America and stuff, but I'm going to tell you what, folks, when it comes down to the bottom line, it's black and white. There's no gray. And what they believe is what they believe, and there is an agenda to wipe out America, to wipe out Christianity, to wipe out Israel, and that was my reason behind uh, not doing that. Could something happen? Could that person get born again? Could he be converted? Yes. In the conviction of my heart, when I'm doing a covenant marriage and I'm joining two hearts to one, I didn't feel like I could do that wedding, and I did not, and I didn't do it. I just said, I'm sorry, I, I can't do the wedding. That's the only one that I ever was not able to do. It took about uh, five years, and they divorced, and they did not stay married. It, and it took even shorter period of time of that, when, because the thing is, and that's a, that is a male-dominated um, yeah. um, uh, religion, culture, and women basically uh, in those third world countries and in a lot of those religions are basically property. Uh, they don't come alongside like God says when he created Adam and Eve to be a helpmate mm -hmm. for them. They don't look at the Bible. They don't look at Genesis. You know, out of the rib, you know, came the wife. It's supposed to come alongside. But yet in those cultures... People can set their wives on fire for just not making a good dinner. Yeah. I read it. I read, read it in the newspaper just a couple of years ago. That's not like, well, you heard that story. No, it was in the newspaper. Yeah. And the thing is, the government and the people in high, high authorities, those are the ones that create those laws. Yeah. They're the ones that create those cultures, and they are not moved. Yeah. I don't care if the younger generation says, well, no, it's this and that, and we're peaceful, this and that. No, the cultural rules and those cultural elders, they rule. And that's what that religion is about. And so, you know, I don't even apologize for, for saying that. Because no. bottom line is, we're, you're marrying someone and they're going into a covenant relationship. Mm -hmm. And if they're not equally yoked like that, it, it, will, it will not work. And that was the only one. Now, if a person's not born again, it's a totally different thing. Mm -hmm. But when a person has another religion, Hinduism, Muslim, that type of thing, I, 
I won't do the I just won't do the wedding uh, only because that might be the nicest guy and and a lot of times what happens folks is the ladies will find a guy that's really really nice because the relationship she's been in before maybe the guy uh, was abusive maybe uh, verbally physically whatever and they finally find a guy that's in the courting and the dating scenario is being very very nice takes her out to dinner does everything really really nice but I'll tell you one mm -hmm. thing when they come from those other cultures that culture will not come out until he's finally got that lady married yes. and he's got her in her home. Mm -hmm. Then little by little, if little by little, what it is and what the, co the true colors, they'll just come out. I have not found one yet that has not, not that that's not happened that way. It's always ended up that way. So that's why when the, the depending on what the religion is, I may or may not do that, do that wedding. But uh, cultural, uh, color, that's okay. Person not born again. That's okay because there's hope for that person to get born again. I've done uh, weddings. I've done weddings like that. So I've even done a wedding in. Uh, I did a wedding in a bar one time. Um, yeah, so let's right. just. I'll just yeah. talk about. Uh, I got a few minutes before you get in there. But uh, the the couple, the one person wasn't saved. And when I did the premarital thing, the guy did get saved. But what they said was, Pastor Sam, we want to do our wedding at Tuli's. I said, Tulis? I said, like, the Tulis on Indian School of 43rd? And they go, yes, the Tulis on 43rd, because we want to dance. And I'm like, okay. So I'm in the couple's home, I'm in their apartment, and um, we do the little premarital thing. And this was kind of a rush thing also, but the person knew me, so they asked if I would do it. The guy gets born again, and, um, and the wedding's very, very soon. And I said, you know what? Okay, I'll do that. I did get a, I had a lot of flack. Uh, I got a lot of flack from wanting to do that in that place, but let me tell you what happened. That uh, was done during the day, it wasn't at night, uh, and what they did was, when we did the wedding, we went in there and they put the wedding up on the big screen. I don't know if you've been in Tulis, but it's got a big old dance floor where they dance. Mm -hmm. they, put the, they put a camera on it, they did the whole thing. Um, I used that opportunity to pray. When I opened up the ceremony, I prayed for every single marriage in that bar. And, uh, whenever, whenever I opened it up and started praying, the bar went dead silent. You didn't hear no pool tables. You didn't hear no cl glasses clinking. It was like dead silence. And I'm up on the screen, and you can see that all over the bar. You know, or it, I didn't call it a bar at that time. I called it... Um, a, uh, a dance establishment. <laughs> but anyway, call it what you want, okay? But, uh, yeah, that's what I told Sherry. It's a dancing establishment. So, but anyway. Um, but that was, uh, that was the thing. It was done during the day and stuff, but it was, it was where they wanted to be. And you know, folks, when, when, whenever you do weddings and stuff like that, you know, nine times out of ten, people are going to drink. Uh, mm -hmm. During the reception, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, to be able to say no, I don't want you to drink or whatever. That's not up to you. That's up to the Holy Spirit. You got You just got to know that something like that is going to happen. Definitely so I thought, you know what? Um, I'm going to go ahead and do that. I'm just going to go there and I'm going to bless them. And in my mind and in my heart, God knew what my heart was. Mm -hmm. You know, my heart was, Lord, I'm going to. I'm just going to pray over them. I'm going to bless that place when I go in there. I'm going to pray the power of the blood of Jesus. So that which I did, I didn't really realize in my heart, the effect that it actually, you know, took place in there, because it, everything went dead silence, mm -hmm. and I even had two people, as I was walking out the door, because they said, Pastor Sam, you going to stay and have some drinks with us, and have, I said, no, no, I said, it was great, thank you for letting me, you know, invite me, I said, but I got to take off, got some things I got to do, okay, well, thank you, you know, but as I'm walking out the door, I had two people come up, one person was a backslidden uh, oh, guy, wow. and he was there, he was going, I was here drinking, he goes, I'm going home to my wife, and I'm going to work things out. Wow. Yeah, that was one guy who said that. And then there was another guy who said, hey, you know, just pat me on the back. Cool, preach, cool deal. You know. <laughs> so I went there. But there was one guy that was sitting there at the bar Amen. that was a born-again Christian, and he was drinking, and his, and his, fam, his, you know, his marriage uh, wasn't what it was supposed to be. He goes, I'm yes. leaving right now. Oh, oh there you go. Yeah, you know, that was for them, but that was for that whole gig was for that guy. That's right. so that, Amen. Sitting right there in the bar. Right there. Did you wear your jeans? I did not wear my jeans. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let me clarify this for I have only worn jeans one time. And it was yesterday. And I will never do it again. So you miss that those you know, That would have been appropriate. Yeah. <laughs> no, I only did that once. And from now on, it's uh, shirt and tie. Go to the All right. Let's keep going. Let's talk about the wedding rehearsal. 
So after you've done your yeah, premarital thing, we talked about that a lot. And, and again, if you guys, once you guys uh, get ready to do, if you're going to do your first wedding and you want to sit down and talk with me, please do that. Okay, just come in. We'll go over. I'll go over the the premarital guide thing with you. I'll, I'll go over the notes that you have right here and the things that you've got on actually how to do that before you actually you know sit down with them. Because one thing to sit in a class is another thing when you're going to have somebody sitting in front of you uh, to actually do that. And that's where the rubber meets the road. And, and so you'll you'll need a little bit of help again, which is totally fine. And we can set that up uh, if and when uh, you begin to do a wedding. Okay. Question. Yes. Would you say it would be okay for ladies to go into the couple's home to do the counseling? You know, no, uh, I would not say that. I did do that. You know, you never want to do anything alone, ever. And, and really, even for the guys, uh, you know, it's just a biblical principle. Normally, I have people uh, come to the church. This was years ago, and I did, I did go to their apartment, but I would, I would not recommend that at all. Bring it to, take them to, bring them to a neutral site, go to a Starbucks, uh, meet them someplace. But I really wouldn't go to their home. Um, I just would not do that. Thank you for thank you for bringing that out. We just have to be really, really careful. Um, you know, maybe if you knew the person and if it's a relative or something like that, you know, of course that's fine. But a person is just calling or whatever. Uh, meet them in a neutral site uh, where you know you'll have people there, and it's even good that you've got somebody you've got somebody with you, okay? Because you just never know. Uh, nowadays, I wish it wasn't that way, but it just is, and we just got to be extra, extra careful, and especially especially ladies. Okay, meet them in a, uh, uh, a certain place. Make sure you've got uh, a couple of people with you, but, but meet in a public place. And, you know, Starbucks, hey, that's the best place to be anyway. So, Okay, uh, let's talk about the wedding rehearsal. Okay, so the last meeting after your premarital session. So you've done your premarital thing, whether you talk to them two times, three times, or just even one time, uh, your premarital thing is, is done. And what you're ready to do now is you're ready to uh, talk to them about the wedding rehearsal. So along with this joyous occasion comes a lot of stress, expectation, and dreams that might cause some problems during the wedding rehearsal. So I'm going to talk about uh, the wedding rehearsal. And as I talk about the wedding rehearsal, I'll go over uh, what, you have, what you're going to talk to them about actually before the wedding rehearsal. But let me just kind of go through this and, and I'll talk to you about this. Uh, you'll meet with a couple prior to the wedding. That's what we're going to talk about right now, the wedding rehearsal. You'll find out how they would like their wedding ceremony to go. Once you find out what they want, notice I underlined what they want, uh, then you're ready for the wedding rehearsal. By doing this, you're letting them know uh, of the potential uh, hurt feelings that might take place during the rehearsal if things are not done in a certain way. So here's what I do. I want you to grab, um, okay, I've given you like two, two different sets of uh, paperwork here. Let me just, this right here, you've got, uh, with numbers down on the, on the bottom, it says 21, 22, and 23. Okay, these are what you can take your notes on. This is what I'm going to be talking about. See this one single page where it says wedding notes? Mm -hmm. Okay, this is what I'm going to be going over, but this is just a, this was out of a booklet that Pastor Greg did quite, uh, quite a long time ago when we were doing an internship, and then we kind of went through this, and then people just took notes there. So that's what you can take notes on, but have this in front of you, because this is what I'm going to be talking about. See this page right here? Wedding notes. I'm going to be going down through here. This is what you're going to do when you talk to um, when you're talking to the couple. So you're you're setting this up. So you guys have had your premarital counseling. You guys have talked to them, and uh, you you got that all out of the way. You say, okay, what is what do you want the wedding to look like? And they're going to have uh, a few ideas, but this is a good uh, deal right here. So you'll want to make copies of this for yourself. Now let me tell you what you're doing. If you're the one that's doing the wedding, you're basically like the wedding. Because you can become the wedding coordinator, which means you're running this whole thing. Or if, you're, if it's a big, big wedding, it's someone's very first wedding, uh, they may actually have a wedding coordinator. And a lot of these things right here, they'll probably, they'll do for you, but you still need to find out from the bride and groom what do they want. Mm -hmm. Here's why. Because they might have a mother-in-law, they might have a mother, or they might have Aunt Bessie or whatever. When you get there and you're starting to do the wedding rehearsal, if you ask a question out loud, and there are more than one lady there, they will all have an answer to that question. Mm -hmm. And it might be a different answer than what the bride wants. Mm -hmm. So what you're doing is, in this premarital rehearsal thing here, you're finding out what the bride and groom wants, and you're telling them, I'll make sure this is what happens on your wedding day. Because they may not want to tell Aunt Sally, or maybe it's a... Uh, mom and dad are divorced, and dad needs to sit on the second row. 
versus the first row. And that's what normally happens. Let me just tell you what happens with a, a, divorced, uh, a divorced couple. Usually you seat the moms. The moms and dads, if they're, if they're married, they usually sit on the very front row. Okay? Now, if it's a divorce scenario, um, moms still sit on the front row, even if they're with their new husband, but the dad usually sits on the second row. Now, you might, in this term, in, in, when you're meeting with them, you might say, hey, they have a great relationship, blah, blah, blah. Would you like dad on the, on the front row with, you know, mom and the, the new husband? Would you want dad and his wife, girlfriend, whatever, on the front row? I ask the bride and groom that, and they might say, what is the protocol? The protocol is that the dad, the divorced spouse, the dad, sits on the second row. Okay, that's protocol. If you look it up, weddings, whatever, that's just how that goes. Now, they, it may be different. You've got a family dynamic. It may not. But the thing is, what happens is, as opposed to the daughter having to tell dad, dad, you need to sit on the second row, that's what you'll do during the wedding rehearsal. You'll let people know where they're going to sit if you've got a blended family scenario and there's a divorce scenario. Now, if the couples are okay and dad's and mom's relationship are okay and they want to sit on the front row, that's fine. But again, weddings and funerals will bring out the worst, best or the worst uh, in, in people. And you have to be aware of that going in so you can help uh, the bride and the groom. Because very, very hard for them. The bride's emotions are all over the place, wanting everything to be perfect. And the last thing she's wanting to have to deal with is a family issue that normally she doesn't like to want, want deal with anyway, but she knows it's there. That's like the last thing she's wanting to deal mm -hmm. with uh, on the wedding thing. So we take care of that w way before that happens, okay? So anyway, you're writing down the couple's name, you write down the date, the arrival time, uh, the sound person. Uh, are they going to have a sound person? Are you going to have live music? You're going to have a CD? You write that down. And a lot of times you want background music being played uh, about 30 minutes as guests are arriving. You want background music to be played. And you just write down there, hey, what time would you like the background music to be played? A lot of times the uh, uh, family is going to have uh, uh, a DJ. So a lot of times the sound stuff is going to be pretty cake because they're already talking with the DJ. They've got their songs picked out, you know, that type of thing. You guys don't usually have to ask that. But these are just things that I ask to make sure it's in line. Because then what I do is, on my notes, when I'm making my notes, I ask them, do you have a background music? Yes, there's going to be an instrumental CD. I write that down. So what I do is I burn a copy of this the day of the wedding, and I go back to the sound person, and I say, hey, Fred, nice to meet you, blah, blah, blah. Just want to compare notes. Do you have this? Do you have this? Do you have this? And a couple of different times he had something a little bit different, and then we needed to get clarification. Oh, well, they didn't know whether they were going to do that or not, because what happens is they may meet with the florist, they may meet with the... Um, guy that's doing uh, their DJ or whatever, and then as they go along, it's like, you know, I think I'd like to do this song. Right. And they switch it, they forget to get back, because there's the details, when, you know, if you've ever gotten married, there's hundreds of details that you got to make sure. And sometimes they forget to tell people, like, I want to have a ring bear, and I want to have a flower girl, and I'm gonna, I want you to jump over the broom, and I want my dad to give me away. So sometimes people will forget what they're doing. And when it's a smaller wedding, it's not too bad. So you got three or four hundred people there. Another type of thing. Okay. Well, the other thing, too, at the yesterday's wedding, they didn't know what to do, how to do the broom ceremony. Mm -hmm. So I said, well, this is what I've seen. Mm -hmm. So they went with it. So, yeah. mm -hmm. so you need to be knowledgeable about some of these things. Right. And all, all the broom scenario was, uh, uh, it's, a, it's a cultural thing that mm -hmm. dates back to the slaves, mm -hmm. uh, you know, type of thing. And uh, what, they, what they indicated to me, and I'll do more research myself, was they didn't really have a lot to exchange or wedding rings or whatever. But this was like their covenant thing mm -hmm. is they're crossing over into their <laughs> new relationship, their new <laughs> life together. Uh, it's kind of like the unity candle type of thing where you've got two separate lights. They light the middle light, which indicates, you know, let not this light be divided. They blow out their outside, the outside lights, saying, I'm extinguishing my life as an individual, and now the two shall become one. So it's, it's just kind of re-signifying that type of thing that they're doing. I'm, we're, we're coming from this life. It's almost like going through an open door. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm leaving this life, and together we're jumping into this next life together. So that was what was uh, said in regards uh, uh, to that culture. So it's the same type of thing. You may do a Catholic wedding, and a Catholic wedding, uh, they have a thing called the lasso. Lasso. I don't know if I'm... Huh? Lasso. Lasso. All right. So in all, all that is, a lot of times during the ceremony, what I've done before is they 
join their hands together, and then you just kind of wrap this cord. And it's the whole thing about a three-strong cord is not easily broken, but it's a unity thing also. And if you do a, a little Jewish wedding, a born-again Jewish thing, which I've done, is you might be standing under a hoopla, okay, which signifies the covering of God. It's got a prayer shawl, the whole thing. And I did that a few months back. So there's just different things that you learn as you do uh, as you do different weddings and stuff. Okay, so we're still doing the wedding rehearsal here. So background music. You find out, would you like the grandmothers to be seated? Uh, would you like the mothers to be seated? Or are you going to light unity candles? You've got to ask these questions. And a lot of times they may say, no, uh, you know, we don't want to do that. Because what happens is you'll have ushers that actually would go up and seat the grandmas. Uh, you'll have, uh, and then what happens is... Once uh, the grandmas are seated, and here's what happens, just so you know, the, uh, the usher, whoever the usher is, you've got to ask them, and it's usually a relative, you know, who's going to seat grandma, what's grandma's names, you know, who's going to seat grandma, and you write all those things down, and the, um, the usher will take grandma down, and where's, where's grandpa at? Grandpa's behind, so he just trails. So they escort grandma down, and they seat grandma, and they escort the other grandma down, and grandma sits down. Then the ushers come back. If they're going to light the unity candles, if it's inside, they'll light the unity candles. Moms usually do that. So the moms will come up to the front. They'll light the unity candle, the two outside candles. Then the moms will come back, and then the ushers will actually seat the moms. This is all part of the wedding ceremony. Background music is going. That's if they, if they want this. I'm giving you guys way more than what a lot of young kids, young I say young kids, yeah. Uh, uh, well, young kids, um, the way they want to do their weddings nowadays. And a lot of uh, weddings, a lot of young kids now, they're wanting to do destination weddings. So you're yeah. doing weddings outside. Yeah. You're not even necessarily doing them in the church. Mm -hmm. uh, they want to do them outside. Mm -hmm. One thing I'll just remind you guys, if they're wanting to do unity candles, uh, that's a rough gig uh, <laughs> to do outside because they usually always blow out. Uh, but I've, what I've found a lot is a lot of younger kids are not doing the unity candles, now they're doing the sand. Right. And so what they're doing is they're combining two colored uh, sand uh, mm -hmm. type of thing. And we get into that, I can talk, uh, talk about that. I use the same scripture verses, I use the same thing as if I'm lighting the candles um, as I do with the sand. Because basically the sand is intermingling. And once that sand is intermingled together, it can't be separated. Mm -hmm. If you've ever tried to separate a grain of sand, it's a different color from another thing. You know that you just can't do that. So a lot of a lot of them now are. I'm just kind of giving you, filling you in. They'll either do candles. They may not even want to do candles. They may not want to do the unity candle. But a lot of them are doing sand now. I don't even think I did. I update this thing to say sand. Now see, I've even updated this thing. But a lot of them are doing sand nowadays. So sometimes, sure. I know what my daughter had a destination wedding in Hawaii that I was on. And they did the, do the sand. And he had a, an old a child, a 13-year-old child, and he was part of the wedding. Mm -hmm. And they did do the sand. Oh, okay. So, so he helped participate he in the helped, sand? He held, he okay. held the, 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 the thing while they poured the sand, in, which is kind of nice. Okay, cool. Yeah, if, you, if again, if they've got kids, blended family, if they want to do something to incorporate the kids in the wedding, that's totally fine. Just kind of ask them, hey, how would you like to do this? We could do this, this, or that, or just something like that. It just makes the kids feel, instead of watching this thing happen, they're actually <coughs> participating in it, and they get, they get buy-in. Because they're going to have the scenarios they're going to have to go through once they're married anyway, so they got to do But boy, starting it off right just really, really helps. So moms light the unity candle. Then the moms would come back to the back and seat the moms. Uh, once the moms are uh, seated, the pastor and the groom and the groomsmen come to the platform. Um, this They do so many different things. Uh, usually once uh, the moms are seated, uh, the, the pastor and, and the groom come up and they stand. A lot of times what happens is uh, then the groomsmen come in. I've had them follow me. Uh, a lot of times they want the music going. Sometimes they want the groomsmen and the bridesmaids to go in to come in together. Uh, sometimes they want them to go out together. Uh, so you just got to ask them, what, what do you want to see? Trust me, the bride will know. She'll know what she wants. But these are just questions. If they don't tell you that, these are just questions that you ask. How would you like that to happen? So, but normally the, the, uh, the, the pastor and the groom, they come up and they stand side by side. And, and always the groom is on your um, uh, left-hand side. The bride is on <coughs> your right-hand side. And when you reverse it, uh, the, the bride's family sits over on the left-hand side. The groom's family is on the right-hand side. It's always that way. And that's how they, when they come down the aisle, they come down the aisle that way also. Okay, 
So once the, the, the uh, pastor and the groom, the groom is usually once they're at the platform, there's a background music that's just playing, it's usually instrumental. We come up there, once we get up there and we stand in place, then usually there's a, a different song, usually, that's being played when the bridesmaids walk in. 